Voices of the Damned. It's a chapter you'll find in the monumental book We Are Satanists by Magistra Templi Rex Blanche Barton, where many Church of Satan members were asked to give their answers to various questions. I'll share some of my answers, talk more about the book, and also answer some listener mail, including the satanic differences between believing the mysticism and enjoying the bazaar. Today on Satan Splain. Well, it's not Satan worship, it's Satanism. It's embracing the life-enriching things which have traditionally been given the devil's name. Pride, lust, earthly success, rational self-interest, atheism, humor, nonconformity, science, a passion for living, being selective about whom we love. We don't see these as shameful sins, but empowering ideals. And we also recognize the psychological power and fun of symbolism and aesthetics, so we utilize Satan as mythology's most fitting mascot for what we're about. Satan Splain, Satanic Talk with Church of Satan Magister Bill M. Magister Bill M. here with Satan Splain. I can't believe it's been over a year now since the release of the book We Are Satanists. I'm sure many of you listeners already have the book. If you don't have the book, you really need to get it. You can buy it from satanme.com, among other places. To give you a bit of background on this book, you see, way back around 1990, Church of Satan Magistra Templi Rex Blanche Barton wrote a book called Church of Satan. It was all about the history of the Church of Satan, who we are, what we believe. And there were further interviews with Anton LaVey in which he clarified a lot of the misconceptions and confusions people had about Satanism and his writings. There were also some great appendices in the back of the book. This is where we first published, so far as I know, the official Church of Satan suggested film list, for example, and the suggested nonfiction book list. Also things like a list of songs with devilish, satanic, or macabre themes that showed up before rock and roll was ever around. And even a sample of dozens of crazy letters the Church of Satan had received over the years. So, fast forward 20 or 30 years, the book is long out of print, any existing copies are going for a lot of money on eBay. We were told that a new version of the book was in the works, so we waited, and we waited, and we waited, and finally, in 2021, we saw it re-released as a new book with a new title, We Are Satanists. I immediately bought a copy, and I can see why it was a long wait, but worth it. This book is huge. The original book was pretty small. This one is over 700 pages. It is meticulously detailed. I'm going to read you a formal description of the book. Blanche Barton's original version of this book, The Church of Satan, was a slim volume distilling Satanism's basic tenets and history to maximize accessibility. This dramatically expanded volume traces the roots of Anton LaVey's notorious religion to ancient Epicureanism and Middle Eastern traditions, through the medieval alchemists and romantic poets, flavored by the decadence of the Hellfire Clubs and the courts of Europe, intertwined through the fin de siècle diabolis to reveal how modern Satanists express and explore this thoroughly contemporary philosophy. You will meet healthcare workers, creative artists, VR developers, scientific innovators, teachers, military personnel, and business leaders who have boldly made their symbolic quote-unquote packs with Satan, reaping considerable rewards. Through Barton's intimate knowledge and extensive interviews with current Satanists, as well as her behind-the-black-curtain access to the present High Priest and Priestess of the Church of Satan, this book provides an unprecedented glimpse into this shadowed, secretive world. Written from an insider's perspective, Magistra Barton also reveals how the Church of Satan has grown since LeVay's death in 1997, with extensive original material from the founding days of LeVay's magic circle, interviews with prominent adherents, scholarly reflections on contemporary Satanism, and a foreword by the current high priest of the Church of Satan, Magus Peter H. Gilmore. This book is a uniquely intimate perspective on the world's most notorious religion, also included our previously unpublished photos and materials from the Church of Satan archives. Now, pretty much everything that was in the original Church of Satan book is in We Are Satanists. Some stuff I noticed was left out, but not really important stuff from what I remember. There was some 
uh, in, in the original Church of Satan book, there was, there was some of this poetic introduction. You know, a person goes into the room and he says, Hell, Satan, and this and that. And uh, also, the, that appendix of the crazy letters, that's not included. But really, if you want to read that sort of stuff, all you have to do is go to Twitter and just read some of the replies that uh, lunatics with internet access leave for the Church of Satan. I mean, you don't really need examples from the 70s and 80s in the book when you can just go on social media and read the idiocy from strangers there every single day. So no loss by not including that appendix. The new book still has over 700 pages of content. If you still want to spend hundreds of dollars on eBay for a copy of the original book, um, okay, fine. But you're getting like 50 times the information at a fraction of the price when you buy the new book, We Are Satanists. Now, I'm proud to say that I am in this book. I mentioned there's uh, a bit about Radio Free Satan, which is part of the Church of Satan history, and I mentioned there. I mentioned in a few other parts as well, including the chapter called Voices of the Damned, which brings us to this episode of Satan's Plane. You see, what happened was back in 2015, a survey of 20 questions was privately sent out to various Church of Satan members. Members sent back their answers to these questions. Now, obviously, the book couldn't include every answer from every Satanist who answered. First of all, that would probably be over 700 pages itself. And more importantly, I'm sure that there would be some repetition here and there as one Satanist answer to a particular question might end up sounding really similar to some answers given by some other Satanists. So for the book, they did the most sensible thing, and that was they took all 20 questions, looked at all of the answers to them, and then they did a mix and match of selected answers from different Satanists who responded. So they did that, and finally narrowed it down to 50 pages of answers. How long it took them to read through everything and narrow it down, I don't know. It could not have been easy. But I'm honored to say that out of those 50 pages that made it, two of those pages are filled with just words from me. And what I'm going to share with you now are my original answers that I submitted to all of the questions, not just what finally made it into the book. So if you're listening to this clip on YouTube, you can go to the description and find links to skip from one question to the next, if you like. So here we go. Bill M's answers to the 20 question survey sent out in 2015 for consideration in the book, We Are Satanists. I'm going to read you the first 10 answers, 10, first 10 questions and answers, and then we'll take a break and then continue after that. Here we go. Question one, how were you first exposed to Satanism? Was it music, books, an internet search, a friend, a family member, etc.? So my answer is, I grew up in the U.S. in the 1980s when the Satanic Panic Hysteria was in full swing. So I had heard a lot about what people, the media, and the entertainment industry were calling Satanism. It had become a hot topic. And also, like a lot of young teens in suburbia, I was bored and curious, so inevitably I did some occult dabbling. And that led to picking up some more detailed information about Satanism, but a lot of misinformation as well. Maybe more on that later. Question two, how old were you when you first read the Satanic Bible, and how did it affect you? So I first obtained a borrowed copy of the book when I was about 14 years old. However, at that time, I was still just a rebellious teenager, trying to find and assert an identity. So I read a few chapters and skimmed a lot of it, but didn't really read it critically yet. It wasn't until I was in my early 20s in college that I picked up the book and really read it as an adult. And when I read it, especially the chapter, The God You Save May Be Yourself, I felt the truth hit me like a ton of bricks. This book had a number of beliefs I held, but had kept pushing to the back of my mind in denial for too many years. I'm reminded of a line from George Orwell's book, 1984, where Winston gets a hold of the Forbidden Book by Goldstein. The line from the book, 1984, is, quote, 
The book fascinated him, or more exactly, it reassured him. In a sense, it told him nothing that was new, but that was part of the attraction. It said what he would have said if it had been possible for him to set his scattered thoughts in order. It was the product of a mind similar to his own, but enormously more powerful, more systematic, less fear-ridden. The best books, he perceived, are those that tell you what you know already. Question 3. Did you voice your enthusiasm right away? If so, how did friends and family react? Well, as profound as I found this discovery of Satanism to be, I was cautious. B before I really committed myself to the idea, I wanted to make sure that this was really something I could stick with and work with, and that my enthusiasm wasn't due to the fact that it was just a new thing for me. I also knew that this wasn't something that everybody would necessarily understand, so I was very selective about who and I would come out to. Uh, I didn't tell any relatives of mine if I knew them to be incapable of having a rational discussion about a topic like Satanism. This means that the f friends and family members I revealed my affiliation to, for the most part, were pretty understanding of it, once I gave them the two-minute explanation of what Satanism is and isn't. And I joined the Church of Satan about a year or so after reading the Satanic Bible. Question four, what did you find most valuable about the philosophy when you first discovered it? Has that changed over time? What I found most valuable was having a label and framework to describe this whole view, which rejected the irrational nonsense of traditional religions, while also accepting the fact that humans ultimately need religion in some form or another. I'll say more about that in answer number six. Over time, it's hard to say what may have changed for me. That what was especially valuable to me after my initial discovery was observing other Satanists and seeing how they manifest Satanism in their lives every, you know, in, in different ways. Satanism is not just a religion, but a philosophy where paradoxically you become more devout by focusing more on yourself and cultivating your strengths as an individual. Question number five, how long have you thought of yourself as a Satanist? My answer is since shortly after reading the Satanic Bible, so that makes it about 20 years. And again, that's what I wrote back in 2015, so you can do the math. Question six. With so many religious slash spiritual options available to people these days, pagan paths, Wicca, humanism, atheism, along with various conventional religions, what does Satanism offer that's different? Now, my answer to this question is what actually got picked from the book, but let me read it for you anyway. Many people have understandably become disillusioned with the dogma and atrocious history of traditional religions, namely Christianity, so it's understandable why many have been attracted to the freedom or government unaffiliated aspects of alternative paths, such as Wicca, paganism, humanism, New Age religions, atheism, and so on. Even a lot of hardcore Christians these days have acknowledged that religion is an ugly word, and in an attempt to rationalize their choice of religion, will now ridiculously try to argue that the religion is not really a religion, but rather a relationship with Jesus, or some other such euphemistic nonsense. People like to say that they're against organized religion, a term that many like to use but never bother to define, Unfortunately, in equating structure so strongly with conformity, a lot of these types of people who say, I'm spiritual, not religious, end up with little structure or direction in their path. Instead of forcing oneself to choose between structure and personal liberty, Satanism offers bedrock without making irrational demands on individual behavior. Unlike Wicca, whose tenets change from author to author, we conveniently have a definitive source, the Satanic Bible. Similarly, I've seen a lot of self-described pagans and New Agers who just seem to be making their rules up as they go along. I would rather have a structure I can work within than to always be changing the rules on a whim. We are atheists, but we don't use the term atheist solely as the identity, since we know that the term atheism describes nothing more than not having a belief in a deity. It can be a liberating starting point, but it doesn't end there. 
Many atheists seem to erroneously think that atheism means not having a religion and the only alternative to their parents' Christianity, when the reality is that there are a number of religions where belief in supernatural deities is simply not required. Satanism, Theravada Buddhism, Scientology, Jainism, Raelianism, and so on. Not to mention there are people who don't have a religion but clearly aren't atheists either. But being a religion and not just a stance regarding deity, Satanism has a detailed philosophy. We also have a central source founded by the religion's founder that represents the religion, the Church of Satan. It's quite common to hear people claim to be spiritual but not religious. Well, as a Satanist, I am religious, not spiritual. By the way, on a related note, I actually published an article a while back called religious, not spiritual. So I use that as an actual title. I think it was published for the Devil's Scroll, a periodical put out by Draconis Blackthorn of the Church of Satan. So maybe I'll bring that essay back sometime. Maybe I'll read it or post it on churchofsatan.com. We'll see. Question seven, what would you like to see addressed in a new Church of Satan history? If we could sit down together for an hour or so, what questions would you have for me regarding the Church of Satan and or Anton LaVey? And I said that the biggest topic that immediately comes to mind is the Internet. The greatest strength of the Internet to me has always been the ability to bring people in touch with information and like-minded people when it normally would have been too difficult. Needless to say, this has been a huge strength to people of minority religions, such as Satanists. In many ways, our world has completely changed from how it was during the initial publication of the book, Church of Satan. That especially includes how we converse with fellow Satanists and collaborate on projects. Unfortunately, the internet has also shown that people on the whole can be just as ignorant as ever. People will usually choose an entertaining falsehood over a hard truth. This is why urban myths get forwarded around all the time, along with inauthentic quotations of people like Albert Einstein, Mark Twain, or George Carlin. Likewise, people who hold some extreme political position or cling to some conspiracy theory do not use the internet to educate themselves, but rather to look for more sites to help reinforce the beliefs they already assume. As always, there have been attempts by disgruntled ex-members and other shit disturbers to create supposed satanic organizations to rival the Church of Satan, and most of these turn out to be little more than websites and disappear over time. What's really sickening is that journalists will take these for granted or think that in the name of balance, they'll have to interview one of these nitwits whenever we're interviewed as well. And even though information on topics like Satanism are just a few mouse clicks away from anybody with an internet connection, many of these journalists are really just in the business of clickbait, not journalism. It's all about who can make the most emotionally charged title for people to click on. A question I suppose I would have to the Church of Satan or to Anton LaVey if he were still alive is, what really is the best way of dealing with not only these pseudo-Satanists, but the clickbait journalists? Now, I know most Satanists will say, well, just ignore them, or well, if you pay attention to them, you're going to give them importance. But at the very least, I think we should correct misinformation when we see it. We have the information, and even direct journalists to that information. They never do any research on their own, it seems, but they still don't read it. Likewise, this isn't really a new topic, but I think once again we need to address the claims that the Church of Satan is dead or somehow hasn't done anything since Anton LaVey passed away. If anything, the popularity of the internet post-1997 has shown that it's easier to pull up examples of what we've done after LaVey died than before. So that was my answer to that question, though since then I think the book has answered some of those questions for me. There's a lot of of dealing with uh, the scholarly side of Satanism, for example. Um, If we hadn't been doing anything since 1997, you couldn't really fill a book of 700 pages anyway, don't you think? Question 8. There was a time when saying you were a Satanist would cause people to question whether you'd be safe around their children and small animals. Do you think that's changed? What kind of reaction do you get when you fly the colors? So my answer is 
Thankfully, some of that has changed. There are certainly some people who will believe that Satanism is all about those baby killing images propagated by horror movies and Christian scare propaganda. Some of them want to believe those urban legends so badly that they'll say that we really aren't the real Satanists, no matter how much information and history is provided. But thankfully, we're no longer in the days of the satanic panic. For one thing, the internet has made it easier than ever for people to get access to information and educate themselves and see what we're really about. Still, I'd say it's clear that most people on the whole still can't accept the existence of Satanism. Perhaps that's sort of the point, as Satanism by its very nature is never going to be accepted thing. It's never going to be an accepted thing by the majority. But uh, no matter how rationally and objectively Satanism is explained to some people, there are those who simply don't want to get it. I've met atheists who absolutely refuse to think that a non-theistic religion, a non-theistic religion could exist and will either desperately try to argue that something like Satanism can't possibly be a religion or are convinced that the world would be better off with all religions eradicated, theistic and non-theistic alike. Then you have the journalists or run-of-the-mill atheists who secretly do understand it, but they, especially the journalists, fear having other people think that they would agree with Satanists, uh, or, or they use the tiresome old argument that we should change the name, even though we've been explaining for half a century now why we chose the name and why it's very fitting. So these days, what you'll see some of these journalists do is the only thing left for them to do and that is attack Satanism through some kind of heckling. So here is something I posted online at that time recently. I posted, To this day, the mere existence of Satanism in the Church of Satan still makes people uncomfortable. In a way, that's kind of the point. However, this goes not only for Christians, but your typical atheists, too. They know that we don't do all of those stereotypical horror movie stuff, and they obviously don't have some superstitious conflict with us like the Satan-believing Christians do. So as a desperate last resort to try and rationalize our existence, they'll simply try to heckle us. A classic example was that journalist whom we trusted to cover the 6606 High Mass, letting him be a part of what was a strictly members-only event, only to have his story be a pile of complaints, jeers, and jabs. I've likewise seen a lot of so-called journalists over the past 15 years report stories by needlessly writing about absurd details with no content. So, for example, you know, they may quote a line from us and then say, he said no and then noticed a tiny piece of lint on his sleeve and he picked it off and then he played with the vegetables on his plate and blah, blah, blah. This has evolved into the sort of edited interviewing you see on the Daily Show, uh, you know, recorded segments in Tosh 2.0 and shows like that. Likewise, I dare you to find any Satanism discussion on Reddit where there isn't some high-rated heckling comment that implies all Satanists are angry 14-year-olds or still living with their parents. If an atheist radio show was going to invite somebody from the Church of Satan, do you think it would be out of genuine sense of curiosity? Showcasing the diversity of atheists? A sympathetic feeling that misconceptions of Satanism should be corrected? Mm, sometimes, but more often than not, they'd usually just want us on in order to try to debunk Satanism for just being a religion at all. And now on to question nine. Has there been a time when being a Satanist has caused you pain, emotional, physical, or financial? I have had a couple of girlfriends, family members, and acquaintances in the past who refused to accept the fact that I was a Satanist. Some of them went out of their way to make me feel bad, like I was wrong. I knew I was right, though. Also, I suppose keeping my affiliation secret has caused a bit of pain in some way or another, whether it, that's uh, having to pay for a P.O. box, the frustration of not being able to come out as Satanist to everybody I know, to keep my real name out of the various accomplishments I've had outside of my professional career and so on. But I've accepted all of this. I have never, ever felt ashamed for being who I am. 
And question 10, our last question before the break, what positive effects does your chosen religion have on your life? My answer, Satanism has served as a creative framework through which I've gotten very tangible results. For example, my radio show, The Devil's Mischief, and Radio Free Satan in general wouldn't have come into fruition if it wasn't for Satanism. When I've run into difficulties in life, I've found solace by thinking of things in a satanic perspective and also using ritual to my benefit. I've also furthered my career by applying principles such as the ones in The Satanic Witch. It's also through Satanism and especially the Church of Satan that I've come to meet so many truly amazing humans, some of whom I've developed very deep friendships with. Let's take a break right now. You are listening to Satan's Plane. You are listening to Satan's Plane, real satanic talk with Church of Satan Magister Bill M. For questions, comments, and correspondence, send an email to bill at satansplane.com. Magister Bill M. here with Satan's Plane. Remember that the official website for the show is satansplane.com. You can go there to find all of the Satan's Plane episodes, links to social media, some news on other things I've been up to, satansplane.com. Of course, you can also listen to Satan's Plane on a variety of platforms. Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts. I kept making the mistake in the last couple of episodes of, of saying iTunes, but somebody did correct me. It is Apple Podcasts. Also, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Audible, and more. For questions or comments, you can email me. Bill at satansplane.com is the email address. Let us continue now with my answers to the 2015 survey sent out to various Church of Satan members in preparation for what became the Voices of the Damned chapter of the book, We Are Satanists. That's the name of the chapter, Voices of the Damned, not the Voices of the Damned chapter. Anyway, you know what I mean. Question 11. Is ritual important to you? If so, how often do you ritualize and what do you do? Formal, informal, on pre-decided dates, as the spirit or need moves, alone or with others, what do you find most effective? My answer, formalized ritual has always been very important to me. I have been doing some form of ritual every Halloween since 1989, and ritualize a few other times of the year as the need arises. I have a satanic altar at home. I have been in many group rituals as well. I have never understood people who call themselves Satanists yet reject ritual completely. They often rationalize this by pointing out that ritual isn't mandatory. That's true, it's not mandatory. However, I'm leery of any self-proclaimed Satanist who rejects two-thirds of the pages of the Satanic Bible and all of the Satanic rituals. Some will argue that true ritual should be 100% personalized, but I think they're often mistaking structure as conformity. Even a very strict by-the-book following of the standard 13-step ritual in the Satanic Bible requires personalization, not only in the central step of visualization of your desires, but your choice of what to use for your altar tools and other ritualistic trappings with which infernal names to read, which Anakian key, and so on. Well, I suppose there is the occasional person who focuses too much on the structure than the experience. It's the other extreme that happens overwhelmingly more often. People who are just too disorganized and undisciplined to get some kind of ritual happening. Then there are the people who claim that they can't find the tools, the time, or the place. I say that if you can't find a place where you can be alone with a black candle and a baphomet for 20 minutes, then you aren't thinking hard enough. Question 12. Have you experienced supernatural, for want of a better word, effects or events in your life, any you'd care to share? My answer, I have experienced a few strange things in my life that I don't have a natural explanation for, and don't feel comfortable chalking up to coincidence. But I just leave it at that. This approach seems to upset both the compulsive skeptic who concerns himself with other people's personal experiences, insisting that there must be some rational explanation for them, and also upsets the mystic who insists that my experience is proof of some supernatural belief of theirs. One of the great things about Satanism is that we can recognize a subjective, a subjective experience 
as just a subjective experience, without feeling a need to attach objective meaning or explanation to it. Question 13. What purpose does the Church of Satan serve? It serves as the central organization to represent the religion of Satanism as outlined in the Satanic Bible. This serves both Satanists and the public at large. Humans invariably want to get together with fellow humans who are similar to themselves, and it's vital to have one official place where Satanists can get the bedrock information, filtering out the devil worshippers or careless authors. Also, having an organization to represent Satanism to the media is helpful for not only being a place to get the story straight, but also so that individual Satanists don't have to keep explaining Satanism 101 for the umpteenth time. They can point to the Church of Satan website, for example, and save all parties a lot of time. I have written a lot about what the Church of Satan does and doesn't do in my essay, Satanism is Not a Congregational Religion, available on churchofsatan.com. So rather than repeating a lot of that here, I'd just like to refer you to that. Question 14. Satanism has been around now as an organized religion for nearly 50 years. What effects, well, it's been over 50 years, of course, since the survey was set out, but anyway, what effects do you see in the world stemming from Anton LaVey and his philosophy? My answer, there are some of the obvious things, like use of inverted pentagrams, baphomets, and the devil aesthetic, but... I think it goes deeper than that. We've seen more subtle aesthetics, art, and philosophical views that were still largely forbidden 50 years ago. As revolutionary as the counterculture movement was, there were also those who embraced true counterculture but rejected the freeloading and self-defeating actions of the hippie movement. A lot of that third-side perspective seems to trace back to the Church of Satan. Question 15. What value do you see Satanism having to reach adult goals applied over a lifetime as opposed to just using it as a way to express teenage rebellion, which is certainly fun and important too? So my answer, Satanism doesn't end with shaking off the shackles of theistic religions and modern conformist behavior. To me, that's just where it starts. The philosophy of Satanism is all-encompassing enough to apply to all sorts of different passages in life. We are aware of the satanic sin of lack of perspective. We embrace indulgence, but we're smart enough to know that immediate gratification, which the modern world offers an abundance of, has its place, and know the value of pride. The satanic attitude of study, not worship, along with knowing that death is the great abstinence, encourages the already curious satanic mind to delve deeper, take inspiration from other earthly successful people, and really see things come to fr fruition. This applies to all sorts of adult endeavors, creative projects, careers, raising a family, everything. Question 16. If there is anything you could add to the philosophy of Satanism or subtract, what would it be? I honestly can't think of anything I would want to add or take away from Satanism. I don't think there's a need to add anything to it because it's perfectly acceptable, if not encouraged or even inevitable, for different Satanists to resonate with certain aspects more than others and to manifest that in their lives in different ways. And I can't imagine subtracting anything because each part seems linked to the rest. Question 17. Have you met other Satanists? If so, do you find you play well together or are you too different from each other to find common ground? My answer, it is possible to be a Church of Satan member and never meet up in person with other Satanists by choice. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. However, I generally love meeting together with other fellow Satanists, and I've had the pleasure of doing so many times over the years. Some of them have become very close friends. I have many fond memories of gathering together with other Satanists for conclaves, rituals, birthday parties, and other social activities. There's really no comparison to being in a room filled with people who are of the same, on the same page as you are and don't have so many of the hang-ups that the herd seems to have. I've also certainly met some Satanists whom I've disliked. When this happens, I try not to associate with them. Sometimes that's as simple as blocking them on Facebook. We're not all expected to get along, but I think it's important to note that when two Satanists disagree with each other on certain topics, the debate isn't over the validity of Satanism, 
but differing views on how people choose to manifest Satanism in their lives. There are also many reasons why the Church of Satan members don't officially congregate frequently, and this is another thing I've addressed in my essay, Satanism is Not a Congregational Religion, which again can be found on the Church of Satan website. Finally, a few more. Question 18. There are many archetypes and arenas to explore within the satanic realms. What archetypes or aspects are you most attracted to? Fiction, politics, vampires, werewolves, computers, business, media, psychology, military, poetry, automobiles. How do you express them slash commune with them? Is it in your dress, your home decor, job, private life? What is it? My answer, if there is a trinity that I embrace in life, it would be mathematics, music, and mirth. There's a lot of overlap in these categories, too. I've written about some of the satanic aspects of mathematics before in an essay called The Number and the Beast, an essay found in the compilation book The Satanic Life. I've often joked that the fact that I love mathematics seems to scare more people than the fact that I'm a Satanist. But like Satanism, the ignorant tend to be scared by it. There's an esotericism to mathematics. It offers a mysterious, endless world to explore. I'm always working on some mathematics problem or another on any given week. In a world where the accepted attitude is to hate mathematics or consider it to be some cold, lifeless enemy of things like art and music, I would say that merely liking mathematics is itself modern-day blasphemy. I am also a musician, but I also try not to be one of those countless subpar musicians out there in the world today. I have a sincere desire to learn more about different instruments, I love music theory, and I'm a big advocate of private lessons and sheet music reading. Again, it amuses me that taking this approach is almost considered blasphemous these days. And some even consider me arrogant for thinking this way. I find myself drawn more and more to entertainers who could play multiple instruments and did things that were outside of the norm in some way. And finally, comedy, third category, mirth. Comedy has always been something I've taken an active interest in. Comedy, by its very nature, I would say, is satanic, a point that Anton LaVey mentions in his essays, The Whoopi Cushion Shall Rise Again, and Taint Funny McGee. And since 2003, I've been hosting The Devil's Mischief on Radio Free Satan, a show with what I call comedy that's not made for the masses. I reject both hack stand-up comedy, and again, see LaVey's essay, Taint Funny McGee, and Satan Speaks for some more information on that. And I also reject the counterproductively crude underground comedy that's all shock and no wit. There's not only a lot of comedy gems and comedic history to be found in really old recordings, but also a lot of satanic wit and wisdom in modern comedians like George Carlin, Doug Stanhope, Patton Oswalt, David Cross, Eddie Izzard, and so on. I'm proud to say that I've introduced many Satanists to these comedians and others over the years. Question 19. If Anton LaVey hadn't formulated Satanism, if it didn't exist in the form it is today, what would you call yourself? So my answer is it's impossible to say for sure. I suppose I would have eventually gravitated to a run-of-the-mill atheist position or maybe, maybe embraced objectivism. But in both cases, I'm sure I'd sense that something was incomplete. And finally, we get to question 20. Question 20 was, what are your favorite satanic movies that are not on the original list in the back of the Church of Satan book? Yes, I am looking for suggestions suggestions on what to add. So this is a topic that really deserves its own separate episode of Satan Splain. <laughs> but I'll say this much. I started off my reply with a brief history of the site's Hollywood and the Sinister Screen, those two websites. I'll talk more about those sometime. I also presented five movie titles with my own little satanic reviews of them. But these were the five movies I picked. The Last Supper from 1995, starring Ron Perlman. Clive Barker's Nightbreed from 1990, which is arguably my all-time favorite movie. And I was happy to see that Magus Peter H. Gilmore wrote an introduction to a reprinting of the book it was based on, Cabal. 
Then also the movie AI from the year 2001. Also the movie Limitless, another favorite of mine from 2011. And finally, the 1985 movie Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Yes, I have a thorough and rational argument on why I think that is a satanic film. Like I said, this sort of topic deserves its own episode of Satan's Plane, so I'm going to leave it there for now. Those are my answers for the 20-question survey for the book We Are Satanists. Now let's get to some listener mail. We'll hear some words from other people, not just me. First, we have a satanic dote. So far, all of our satanic dotes have been about confrontations with Christians in public, but it doesn't have to be that. If you have a satanic anecdote you want to send me, something that's a good anecdote, something that nobody else would be giving, and of course is satanic in some ways, send them to me, bill at satansplain.com. Let us cue the new Satanic Dote theme song. Satanic Anecdotes. Satanic Dotes. This Satanic Dote comes from Mark. Mark says, Two years ago, I was a passenger on an internal flight within New Zealand. We had taken off and the hot beverages had just been served. I settled into my seat and began to read the Satanic Bible, my book of choice when I travel. Almost immediately, there was a tap on my shoulder from the seat behind me, and a very well-dressed gentleman wearing a crucifix pin started to rant and rave at me. That is a very dangerous book you are reading, he exclaimed, and it should not be allowed to be displayed in a public place. He went on to advise me to repent or suffer Eternal damnation in the fiery pit of hell. Sounds awesome, actually. But before I could work up a decent retort, the plane hit a pocket of turbulence, and his fresh coffee went all down the front of his crisp white evangelical business shirt. It must have been hot, because he let out quite a roar as this happened. After turning my back and inquiring, Would you like sugar with that? I returned to my reading. He had an unsuccessful attempt to change his seat and spent the rest of the flight in silence. I love the principle of coincidence, especially when it means I can relax and indulge in the comedy of circumstance. Well, thank you, Mark. That was indeed a great satanic dote. I've also got an email here from Joe. Joe says, I am writing to say thanks for doing the Satan's Plain podcast. I enjoy the topics you cover. I especially appreciated that you had what you had to say on comedy in episode number three and home homeschooling in episode 11. I was homeschooled, so I am particularly biased. I found the Satanic Bible a few years ago and have referred to myself as a Satanist ever since. I've also read a number of other books from the Church of Satan, including the Satanic Scriptures. I have wanted to join the Church of Satan for some time, but it wasn't until after episode 11 that I decided to go for it. I run an account on social media in the UFO community. For a while, I was making amateur cartoon strips to get a laugh out of the community. I have seen you like one of my tweets, so I felt I would let you know They are aware that I am not affiliated with the Church of Satan or any other groups. My account was never meant to get big, and it isn't all that big now, but it is interesting because of the people who started following it, authors, journalists, etc. I understand I can do what I want, but I support what you and the Church of Satan do, and I will gladly delete my account if you view it as an impotent of any sort. So, I wrote back to Joe... And I said, well, thanks, first of all, for listening to Satan's Plane, and I'm glad to hear you've decided to join the Church of Satan. Maybe I'll see you on the other side, you know, see you on the inside somewhere. As for your own Twitter account on UFOs, I don't see why you'd want to or need to delete it. I don't see why there'd be a conflict. Maybe I'm missing something here. But if it's... If it's just a UFO channel, you know, poking fun at the UFO believing phenomenon and so on, then I don't see what the problem is. Now, at first when I read it, I thought maybe he meant 
it might be a problem because I'm professing like a belief in UFOs or I'm sharing UFO stories. And I've seen this come up before in discussion. And so I'd like to give a little rant about that, if I may. There's, And yes, this gets into the other topic that I mentioned at the very beginning of the show. There is nothing in Satanism that dogmatically says Earth is the only planet in the universe with life. There is nothing in Satanism that says you can't have interest in UFOs, that you can't read books about it, that you can't talk about the topic. In fact, I think I said something about this in the previous episode when I was answering the seven honest questions for atheists. I guess the concern here is that Satanists are atheists uh, with free thinkers, therefore we have to be skeptical of any and all strange things like UFO stories or the Loch Ness Monster, haunted houses, or, you know, the sorts of things that you'd see on the Art Bell show or that Leonard Nimoy show from the 1970s, In Search Of. And, again, I just think that's ridiculous. It's not like... The only options in life are, one, believe everything you read about this sort of stuff without question, or two, reject it all and condemn it all as dangerous nonsense from charlatans and gullible idiots. I mean, let's face it, Satanists are different. You've got to be at least a little bit of a weirdo, in the eyes of the masses at least, to have found a home in Satanism. So... It's not surprising that Satanists are often into strange or eclectic things. Not in a pretentious hipster way, because hipsters don't like it when they run into people who are into the same things. But no, um, you know, people who have that genuine curiosity about things in life. I mean, last year my wife and I went to the Area 51 rest stop in Nevada, and we thought it was fun. Were there actual aliens that landed at Area 51? Probably not. It was probably a weather balloon or something that happened that night and people built a whole myth around it. But I do dig the myth. I like, you know, the alien keychains. I liked the t-shirts. I bought myself an Area 51 coffee mug, which I use. I love the aesthetic that you see in movies like the Men in Black movies. I'm personally not into a lot of ufology, UFOlogy or whatever it's called, but there are certainly some other Church of Satan members who are, some Satanists who are. I have I even remember a group of uh, Church of Satan members doing a SETI project together. The SETI at Home project was a thing where people used their home computers to send out messages and stuff to outer space, if I remember correctly. So anyway, you get my point. You can be into strange, unexplained, macabre, weird things without necessarily being a mystic. We are atheists, yeah, but we're not of the Puritan variety. You know what I mean? But I I see some atheists now and then who don't seem to understand this, that people, or at least rather some people, can enjoy something as a curiosity or as a novelty without letting it affect their day-to-day rational mind. And if you're an atheist who can't do that, who won't do that, well, maybe you're not really as free and liberated from supernatural claims as you think you are. You obviously still have some kind of emotional hang-up about that if you're going to get angry at people for owning an Area 51 coffee mug or a keychain with their horoscope sign on it. And I'm just going to leave things there. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Hail Satan. You have been listening to Satan's Plane. If you have enjoyed this episode, please give it a like and subscribe where available. For more information on the show, visit satansplane.com. And to learn more about Satanism itself, visit churchofsatan.com. This episode, copyright 2022, Magister Bill M.